Yes, indeed, Oda. Yes, yes. Oh, greetings, everyone. I was just admiring the fine art that is One Piece. Yes, truly a glorious fine art. The cover spread of this week shows Luffy shoving a bunch of french fries into his mouth as he's floating up on a bubble. Yes, truly. You know, seriously, though, after One Piece is concluded, I, I, I'm sure there's been, like, art gallery shows and stuff with One Piece before, but after One Piece is said and done, I want to go to, like, a museum in Japan, and I just want to see every single cover page that Oda has drawn, like, every double page, like, color spread, framed in this glorious, like, like just entrance hallway. Like, I just want to be like, ah, oh, yes, yes, that was fun. Ah, oh, yes, I remember the one where they were playing football. Ah, oh, yes, I remember that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be fun. That would that be cool? That would be really cool. All right, well, we got our uh, last One Piece chapter for about a month or so, so uh, buckle in. I hope it's a good one. One Piece chapter 1110 plus one, which means one, 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 one. I might have added an extra one there. Maybe not. I don't know. Not great with counting. Um, but uh, yeah, everybody that was thinking this was going to be a chapter where it's like, okay, this is Zoro's moment, right? Because Zoro's wanted booster. It's one, 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 one. It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. I mean, like, he, he shows up. He, he certainly is there. He's, he's actually, uh, okay, he's not on the first page, but he's in the second. He's in the second page. But, uh, yeah, we don't really do much with Zoro in this chapter at all, so sorry, everybody out there that was really hyped for Zoro, you know, me included, but hey, what are you going to do, right? Um, okay, uh, the chapter's title, I should probably say that. It's called The Sun Shield, which is a really cool name for a chapter, and I can't put my finger on it, but I have heard that term before, Sun Shield. I don't know if it was on like a Yu-Gi-Oh card or some like anime or some cartoon I watched when I was a kid, but that, wait, wait a minute, is it from, does anybody remember Transformers Armada? Because I remember there were some, like there were three weapons in Transformers Armada. There was like a star sword and there was a gun. And I think it was, was that the Sun Shield? No, that was the Sky Shield. Yeah, it was like the you know, Sky Boom Shield. That's what it was. The, the completely tangential, but like that was a cool anime. Check that out. But uh, I've, I've heard Sun Shield before, right? It sounds like a cool anime attack. And it is here, but like other places I've probably heard of it. I don't know. Anyway, um, so we continue where we left off with the Goro set. Which one of the Goro say? Well, we're focusing on Marcus Mars, who is a giant Itsumade, which is like a creepy bird that lets out creepy sounds. And um, it's just been, I guess, slamming itself into the frontier dome. We saw it in the last chapter. Slammed into the dome. It exploded. And I guess it didn't breach it. But here we see it slam into it again. And I guess he just kept going back and forth. Like, he gets hit. He gets damaged by the lasers. He heals up. And just after enough damage is done to one spot. I guess maybe the laser grid couldn't recover in time and then he eventually breached it. Uh, question about the Frontier Dome because the way that the Frontier Dome was originally explained uh, at least the way I understood it which I could have been off on this was that it's basically surrounding the Labo phase as like a motion sensor grid and anything that crosses that motion sensor just gets nuked with a bunch of lasers. I didn't actually picture it as like a laser force field Field, like a grid of lasers, like active lasers that you physically like can touch. I thought it was more of like a beep beep boom, not like a you know kind of thing. Uh, apparently, I guess it is like that. I don't know. I don't know. There was just something with that. I, I, I guess it was always like that, but whatever. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Marcus just keeps slamming into it. Eventually, he breaks through, and he does l arrive in the labo phase. So he's looking down at the lab. Uh, Jimbe notices him, and is just like, Oh, what is going on with this giant burb? The hockey of this thing is unreal, Zoro. We gotta get moving. The fight's over. You won, right? And then we see Zoro there, and he's like, Oh, yeah, it's don't worry, Jinbei. I took care of this leopard. And then the leopard's over there. Luchi's over there. He's like, I'm not dead. I will not fall. And so Luchi is standing up. Okay. He's pulling a white beard, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever seen a more magnificent display of strength than Edward Newgate himself? He died on his feet, and so will Luchi, probably. So Luchi, I mean, like... 
don't don't take it the wrong way, you know, if you're a Zoro fan. Like like Lucci is effed up here. I don't know if it's early enough in the video for me to say the F word. Whatever. Lucci is fucked up here, okay? He's he's really bad. Alright, like you can see a lot of blood gushing. Like blood is just oozing out of his mouth here. He is standing, but he can barely move. And so he looks over and he just he just kind of snarls at them. He's just kind of like channeling the, the the inner carnivore of the leopard and it's just rawr, you know like trying to intimidate them maybe or something um and sanji is like over the comms and just like hey jinbei if you pick zoro up i have no idea what's going on right now and then jinbei is like okay don't worry guys i'm on this all right and so zoro i guess is about to like oh okay he's still standing well okay it looks like i'm not done yet you know i'll show that damn swirly eyebrows who's a a, a drag down who's a burden and jinbei literally has to like put him into an arm lock like the dad that he is and just like no no you're done you won son you won calm down all right? Let Papa take care of this. I'm just gonna keep referring to Jinbei as the dad of the Straw Hats, because Oda pretty much confirmed that he was. <laughs> just like, he's walking around Egghead wearing the, the Hawaiian shirt and the cargo pants or the cargo shorts. He's like, he's a dad, okay? He's like, no, son, you got this. It's okay. Let, let me handle this. Fishman Karate, 5,000 brick fist. And I guess he just, like, like, the shockwave off of this technique is absurd. I can't tell from the angle if Jinbei is, like, punching the ground or if he's punching directly forward towards Luchi or if he's, like, swiping the air and just, like, the air pressure, like, shockwave of this. Anyway, massive explosion with this technique, and that sends Luchi flying back a considerable way. Knocks the awakened zone right out of him because he gets knocked out by this uh, air wave, and he lands and some other part of the Labo phase, and he just gets knocked right the hell out. Not, not knocked out, and he's still conscious, but he's knocked out of his animal form. He's back into his human form. You even see part of the, um, the ribbon, you know, that black ribbon that was like around his neck like all Awakened Zones have. You see that actually dissipate as he goes back into his human form, right? So Rob Lucci's just there in his human form. He's still bleeding. Looks like he has like a giant hole just right there in his neck. Um, although he's been working out. He's got, he's got a pretty tough neck since the last time I saw him, right? Well, anyway, he happened to land right in the same location that Marcus Mars has breached the barrier, so this giant eerie bird just, Kah! just appears in front of Lucci. It's just like, Rob Lucci of Cypher Pole. Aegis Zero, or Aegis Zero. I just finished playing Persona 3 Reload, and Aegis was the name of that character, so I guess Aegis is the correct way to pronounce this. Aegis, you're with us. Junpei, guy's room. Man. Whatever, anyway. Uh, where is York? Marcus is like directly to it. And, um,. And Jinbei is hauling Zoro out of there, like, we gotta get out of there, and Luchi's still there, and like, before he completely loses consciousness, he's like, she's still chained up in the control room, <clears throat> fourth building, building A, oh man, I'm losing a lot of blood here, um, the two that just ran off are Zoro and Jinbei, there are five more strides up here, I don't know where they are, and two Vegapunks, so, dude, you gotta hand it to him, he also holds up a black Den Den Mushi, so he was listening in on all of the, um, the exchanges, I guess, of all, I I'm assuming the comm networks that the Vegapunks are using is an offshoot of the Den Den Mushi network, so they could still kind of overhear things. Like, the Jerma also used, like, a comm. Like, they had, like, actual radios and stuff. Maybe those networks... I don't think it was its own separate thing, like radio waves. I think it was still the psychic network of Den Den Mushi, so that means, like, the black Den Den Mushi could still wiretap it, right? So he holds that up, and he's just... Dude, Lucci, like... I, I Okay, I gotta be honest with you, with Rob Lucci. Um... I mean, like, he's basically a dog of the government, sure. There's plenty of opportunities for him to have been like, you know, oh, the government doesn't care about us, they're gonna buster call us, they don't care about our lives, we're just moving forward. No, Rob Lucci, he's he's 100% with this. He's just like, you know what? Even more so than Kizaru. Kizaru, you still get the idea that he doesn't want to do this, but, yeah, whatever, it's his job. Lucci's like, nope, you know what? 
I made my peace with this. I've been raised ever since I was a kid to be an assassin. I'm an assassin. I'm gonna live as an assassin. I'm gonna die as an assassin. I work for the world government. I'm a member of Cypherpol. I'm always going to be a member of Cypherpol. And he's just come to terms with that. And before he loses consciousness, the last thing he does is give a thorough briefing, a uh, debriefing, whatever, to one of the Goro say, of just like, here's the situation. Here's all the striats where their locations are as best of my ability. York is in the fourth floor. She's chained up on building A. There you go. And um, uh, also he goes on to even, he, he really delivers a full report here. He's like, the two Vegapunks are there. They're escaping from the back entrance, you know, northeast. They're going to blast off from the island. There's also 85 Cypherpole agents and four Seraphim in prison in the basement. Like, Lucci is like, <laughs> oh, no. I'm losing a lot of blood here. About to pass out. All right. Well, here's where everybody is. Thorough report. Yes, indeed. It's just like, okay, holy shit. Oh, and also he concludes that he looks really bad. He's like sweating profusely. He's like, we have six minutes also before Vegapunk's message is released to the world. And then Marcus Mars is just there like flying and just like, splendid work. I have no further questions for you. You know what? I was going to question at this point, um whether or not it was actually Marcus's ability, because we know the Garose have weird powers, you know. Saturn has the ability to just give the mean look at somebody and make their heads blow up. By the way, I always assumed that was something shared by all the Garose. Maybe not, maybe it's something specific to Saturn, because we haven't seen the other Garose do it. But it's an ability that, um... Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, why didn't Saturn, why isn't Saturn using that immobilization ability on Dory, Bragi, and Luffy? Maybe it doesn't work on Luffy because he's the sun god or whatever, but he was able to immobilize Frankie and Sanji, and Sanji's pretty damn strong. So, huh. Yeah, I don't know about that. Anyway, yeah, regardless of that, I was thinking maybe Mars was, like, manipulating Lucci's mind, like, Rob Lucci, give me a report. And even though Rob Lucci's about to die, he's just like, I will give a report. But not really the case here, because Marcus says, oh, I have no further questions, and then he begins to fly off, because he's just like, what's the situation? And Ru Lucci delivers the situation. He's like, very well. And then he goes to leave, and Rob Lucci kind of stops him and just like, wait, wait, hold on, one last thing. My partner, Kaku, he should still be in the lab phase as well, imprisoned in a bubble. Please somehow find a way to spare his life. And then Mars does give him a response. He basically says, that might be impossible. It's hard to, uh, to uh, single out a lowly insect when you're exterminating the whole lot. And he just, he just flies off, okay? So obviously the Gorosei do not give a shit about Luchi or Kaku, only about how useful they are to them. Um, you know, they refer to every other human as insects, you know, so far beneath their notice. In the case with, like, Rob Luchi, I kind of think they view them more as, like, not even really living things. I mean, to them it's probably the same deal, but, like, like pieces on a chessboard, you know? Like... In that instant, when Mars is kind of giving Lucci some accolades, he's not really praising Lucci as a person. He's more like saying, you are a useful uh, piece to me. You are the queen on my chessboard, and you are useful. But you are, at the end of the day, just a piece. You are an object in my mind. A useful object, but still just an object. And so Lucci's here like, Please save Kaku if you can. He's like, you're just a piece. You don't tell me what to do. I'm the one playing the game. You have no, you have nothing. I'm out of here. And he just leaves. Okay, that's I, that's the way I'm kind of looking at them here. They call them insects, but from their perspective, probably the same difference, right? Um, so far beneath the status of what the Goro say consider probably just themselves and Eam are the only ones they consider equals or betters. So they consider themselves equals, and then Eam is their better, and then that's it, right? Everything else are insects or just pieces. Now, the fact that Lucci actually has some care and understanding and sympathy for Kaku is is nice to see. And it makes sense, because most of the Cypherpool 9 agents all grew up together on that island. They were basically orphans brought together. We saw that in uh, the Strong World Chapter Zero. I believe we saw Lucci training with Jabra and uh, Blue and O when they were children. So th that's the closest thing they have to an actual family. Uh, Spondum is not included here. Spondum basically became their boss later 
later on, and they didn't care about Spondom. Nero, I don't know, maybe if Nero stuck around longer, they would have loved him like a brother, but no. So the, the closest thing that Lucci has to a familial bond with anybody are like Jabra, Blue and Oak, Halifa, Kumadori, and uh, Kaku, of course. And Kaku is like second in terms of strength next to him, so it's probably like he views him like his best friend or maybe even his actual brother. So it makes sense that Lucci would be like, hey, look, I don't want to see Kaku die. All right, so please save him if you can. And then Marcus is like, well, I don't give a shit about that at all. And he just, he just goes off and Lucci's just, I, we don't see him after this. I'm guessing he just passes the hell out. But it is nice they acknowledge Kaku. We don't see him. Well, actually, I don't know. I don't know. I have to examine the final page when we get to the Labo phase. But, uh, yeah, this is an interesting scene with Lucci. He does at least care about Kaku enough to um, break protocol. Because he this is one of the Goro say here. And he knows that, like, this guy could turn around and probably kill him in one attack. But even then, Rob Lucci's like, I know this goes against what a Cypherpole agent does. I know this goes against whatever. But I got to ask him to at least try. Okay? And so, yeah. So. So, moving back down to the fabrication phase, we now have Luffy. He has just been rescued out of the gullet of Saint uh, Shepherd Jew Peter, who is a giant sandworm. Um, you have Dory and Broggy that showed up and they diced the sandworm down. You see part of the body still lying there. A lot of people were thinking maybe the pieces were going to form into other sandworms, but nothing like that happens there. Um, Dory's there and Luffy's bouncing around in their hands and just like, Oh, it's been over two years! Gyo, 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 gyo. Yeah, we hardly recognize you. Damn, you were looking like the sun god, right? Um, and Luffy has no idea what's going on with that, by the way. He's just like, sun god, huh? What's that? I don't know what that is. In fact, the way that uh, Broggy speaks about it here, he's just like, they tell tales of the sun god in Elbath. But tell me, Straw Hat, how did you know the way he looked? Like, almost implying, like, like I'm, maybe they, they're probably not 100% sure on how the whole idea works with his Awakened and he actually has a mythical zone the entire time. Maybe they're just thinking that, like, Luffy learned about how the Sun God appeared and went and dyed his hair and is just acting like the Sun God or whatever, because apparently Luffy is the spitting image of the Sun God Nika, all right? Which means also a spitting image of the way Joy Boy looked, which maybe that is the lore at Elbaf, like, the reason why those images or the drawings or paintings of the Sun God exist are because like 900 years ago during the Void Century that's when Joy Boy lived and had the power and it resembled him as well. Might have been something like that. Luffy's like, yeah, I, I don't really get what you're talking about, but we could discuss all this later. Um, and uh, the other Goro say, so you have Top Man and you have Saturn there. I guess, uh, you know, Shepard is still regenerating. Uh, Peter. Peter is still regenerating. And so uh, Saturn is like, hmm... This uh, is a complication to the plan here. And Dory and Broggy are staring down the Goro saying they're just like, Ah! Oh, man, reminds us back in the jungles of Elbaf, like the old days, doesn't it, Broggy? Yes, indeed, Dory. Ah, oh, yes. Um, and they even kind of look at the Goro say, Broggy even looks at one of the Goro say, just like, Hey, old timers, you know, we're not here to fight. We're just here to get Straw Hat out of here. They mention Sanji and the whole evacuation plan. Uh, we see a nice little map of Egghead at like the angle of evacuation so everybody's heading toward um was it the northeastern or northwestern i think it was the northeastern side of the island so we see kind of where everybody's at uh nami and usopp's group in the labo phase we see the ship you know the elbaf ship heading back toward the island of giants bonnie's group with frankie and kuma and atlas has arrived there so they're very very close to getting on the ship but they're not quite there yet uh, then we have Sanji and Vegapunk. Now, Vegapunk is shown in the little mini-map. Sanji carrying Vegapunk right behind Jewelry Bonnie and um, Frankie's group, right? So, I don't know if that means Vegapunk's still alive or what. It's just like Sanji has Vegapunk's body at the very least, right? And then you see Luffy's group, which is even behind Sanji. So, it kind of goes, you know, ship... Bonnie, Sanji, Luffy. So they're the furthest back, so they got a long way to go here. Dory takes out an awesome Elbaf like war horn and is like, well, we had to let them know that we found you. That was a cool horn sound effect. All right, neat. I could do that. That's cool. Anyway, so he sounds the horn. He Heimdall sounds Ragnarok. And um, that lets out a giant blast throughout the entire island. And all of the giants hear that loud and clear. Like, all right, that's the signal from the captains. They found Straw Hat. We need a mosey. We need to get on out of here, right? Rescuing them was our only goal. It's not like warships have treasure to loot anyway. So the giants are like referring to all of the marine ships 
ships they're sinking. They're, they're warfaring giants from Elbaf. They love a good scrap, ladies and gentlemen. But at the end of the day, they are, they're not like so war crazy. They're like, no, we must keep fighting. They knew what this was, an escort mission. And while escort missions might not always be the most fun, yeah, you're escorting the Straw Hats. So that's probably the best one out of all of them, right? Okay. So uh, then you have Top Man. The giant boar from Chinese mythology, the Hokey, all right? Now, this is really cool because Top Man didn't do diddly dick in the last chapter, okay? He turned into a giant boar, refused to elaborate, and just stayed there, right? So now he's walking up, and he's just like, all right, you're blasting a horn of retreat? Well, allow me to make a toot myself. Pfft, not like that! And then you have Top Man just opening his giant mouth and just like, roar! And it's just this giant epic blast of Conqueror's Hockey just booming out of this guy, right? And so Dory and Broggy are there, they both raise up like their shields, like their bucklers that they have, and they're just like, whoa, Nelly! <laughs> That's a big boar, you know? So giant shockwave of sound in hockey reverberates, just blasting all the buildings and everything behind it. It's insane. The reaction that Luffy has <laughs> is so good, all right? So Luffy's right there. He gets hit with it. He's like, what? Boom! I'm just gonna say what happens and we're just gonna roll with it, okay? That sounds fantastic to you. That sounds fantastic to me. Um, Luffy loses his shirt and his sandals and his eyeballs and the scar on his face and his hat and the scar that he got from a kainu at Marineford. Um, keeps on his shorts, though. Thank God. All right, yo, the shorts get knocked off, and it's just, this is why I'm the sun god. Boom! It just shines. You know, like what happened at uh, Amazon Lily. But no, his hat, his uh, scars, his sandals, and his shirt, and his hat, and his eyes just all get blasted off him at once. And so Oda just draws Luffy without all of that. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the marines that are outside of there, this was such a, a war horn blast of hockey. There's marines that are out at sea on the evacuation, like warships, as they're leaving the island that get hit by this, and they go down, right? Um, so Dory and Broggy are kind of like, because, you know, Luffy was kind of bouncing around in Broggy's hand when they got hit with the hockey blast. And so they kind of like, you know, whoa, you know, Strider, are you, you okay? You all right, buddy? And then it's like, whoa. That was close. Luffy, like, picks up all of his body parts, pops his eyes and his nose, and he's holding up his scars like they're stickers, and just like, wow, that was close. I almost lost my defining characteristics. Can you imagine if I lost my scars? Man, nobody would even recognize me anymore. He just puts, <laughs> taps the scars back on his body. <laughs> Which, don't even try to bring logic into this at that point. So in Gear 5th, Luffy could just peel off the scar he got from Akainu and just chuck it away. <laughs> yes, he can. You know, hey, hey, far from the weirdest thing we're going to see with this power. If nothing else from this chapter, we have truly and utterly learned that the limits to Gear 5th are Luffy's imagination, okay? Like the kind of, think of whatever, you know what, maybe he could clone himself now. We're going to see some weird shit here in a second, so just bear with me. All right, so a conqueror's hockey roar. Who is this guy? I don't know, Dory. He's some kind of government big shot. Well, good thing Al Baff don't pay taxes. All right, couple of things, uh, jokes aside, something some to wind back here, okay. I was never really confirmed what the status was between the government and Elbaf. It was heavily implied that Elbaf was not allied with the world government. But there are giants that work for the Marines that are part of the giant squad that are mostly all vice admirals. And then we also have John Giant, who was the first giant that enlisted. And that was because of Mother Caramel and everything like that with the trafficking, that stuff that happened. Right. So um, I, I, the giants don't keep their own on the island. Like if you're a giant and you want to leave Elbaf and join the Marines, you can do that. Like, they're not going to prevent you from doing that. Um, but that definitely means, like, Dory and Broggy, even though, yeah, they are a century out of touch with most things, um, they've never heard of the Gorosei before. They've never heard of the higher echelons of the world government because they probably do not give a shit. So, you know, the government was around when they were still pirates. So if they were part of Elbaf, part of the world government, they probably would have known about this. They're just like, oh, yeah, these are some big shots of the world government. I don't know. Some guys, they're old dudes. I don't know. Like, they don't even acknowledge them at first. They're just like some old guys that have zone powers. They don't know they're the freaking Gorosei, right? 
So anyway, um, now we have Top Man. If that wasn't enough, Top Man also proceeds to spin his legs Kind of like the wheel guy from Any's Lobby. Remember that dude? He was a Devil Fruit. He was the only manga exclusive Devil Fruit user because his Devil Fruit ability was not shown in the anime. It was omitted for some reason. But the, he was the user of the wheel wheel fruit and he could, you know, spin his limbs like wheels. And it's kind of like that where I can't tell if all of Top Man's body is spinning like this or it's just his legs, but either way, he's spinning his whole body up off the ground, so he is a flying pig! I told you! Y'all laughed at me! Actually, nobody really laughed at me on that one. Actually, I got a lot of people saying that, like, yeah, he could probably fly. Yeah, so there you go. Anyway, yeah, this pig can fly, ladies and gentlemen. So, he lifts himself up, and he just charges at Dorian Broggy. His tusks, which were made out of just regular tusk material, transform into swords. So they go to, like, stab Dory and Broggy, they both take out their, um, their bucklers. They're not really shields, because, like, bucklers are kind of, like, these smaller, um, they're, uh, honestly, I think, more used for, like, melee, like, punches, and, like, blocking, or, like, disarming somebody when they get close to you, because, like, you know, a shield, like, that small, relative to the size of a giant, would not be able to properly block, like, arrows or anything like that. I I'm sure they make giant kite shields and tower shields for giants on Elbath, but these are more for, like, melee weapons. Like, you got a sword in one hand, you got a buckler over here, you can like block an attack, you could punch your opponent with it or whatever. So Dorian and Broggy both hoist up their bucklers at the same time and they block, you know, each tusk from Top Man slamming into them. Sun Shield! All right, so that's the title of the chapter, and they flex their mighty Elbafian muscles, and they block the attack. And we have an awesome line here where um, Top Man slams into the giants, and they're kind of like, you know, kind of pushing each other back. And Top Man is like, do you have any idea who that boy is? What thread of destiny pulls you together? Do you know who he is? And then Dory and Broggy are like, of course we do. He's our friend. And they both smack Top Man back. He flies back on his ass. And then that's pretty cool. And then, no, we're not done yet. Because next up we have Saturn that's like, all right, well, if that's your decision, then I'll erase you where you stand. And so Saturn kind of absorbs. He kind of, you know, breathes in all the air around him. And then he spits out a bunch of, like, poison ball bombs that are flying straight toward Dorian Broggy. And Luffy is even aware because he's been fighting Saturn for a while. So Saturn has like the extending arms and can also like melt everything. So Luffy's very aware that's like highly, you know, toxic venom. So he's like, hold on, guys, that's venom. I got this. All right, I want you to also understand that when Luffy acts here, like this it has to be happening at light speed, okay? Or very, very fast. This is like Matrix bullet time here, okay? Because Saturn is spitting these balls of poison. I mean, like there's like a lot of them. There's a lot of these balls that are like sent flying at Dorian Broggy. Luffy's like, stop! And then like, he reaches out. He grabs a palm tree. He hoists the palm tree right out of the ground. He takes his teeth like a freaking, I don't know, like a wood chipper buzz saw. I, I don't know a lot about carpentry, okay? You know, I'm not Nick Offerman, all right? Well, anyway, he takes his teeth and he just like grinds the entire trunk of the tree down. Like, he just grinds it down, turns it into a baseball bat. Uh, then he takes a can of paint that he just spawns out of nowhere, paints the baseball bat, has a 56 on it because that's Luffy's number, like Go, Go Mu is, is 56, right? It's also the reason why Katakuri's bounty was 1 billion 57, like, you know, Katakuri's one better than Luffy, that was kind of the idea. So it's 56 on the bat, looks like a nice impressive bat, and then he pulls a baseball helmet out of hammer space that also has a 56 on it, puts it on, like, Dun 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 charge and then just smacks all of the great form by the way smacks all of the poison bullets which I am sure probably do not even have, like, their poison. It's like a liquid being shot at you. Luffy hits them all with the bat, like, they're, they're solid material, and smacks all of them back. Like, 
I don't even know how many there are. Like one, two, there's one panel where there's uh, five of them. This other panel shows six distinctive impacts, like the impacts of Luffy hitting them. When Saturn first spat them out, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. There's like way more than that. And so Luffy just smacks all of them away with one swing of the baseball bat he just made. And he just begins laughing his ass off. Like, <laughs> have a taste of your own medicine now. This'll probably hurt you. Home run! This is a grand slam for sure. And all of <laughs> all of the poison venom balls hit the Garose, and then they just blow up in like mushroom clouds. Like like three localized nukes just go off at the same time. And Luffy is even shocked by this. Like, what? They exploded? Man, it was probably a good thing I threw those things away back at him then, isn't it? That could have been us. <laughs> okay. So, um, wow, they uh uh did, yeah, <laughs> all right, that happened. Dude, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go over that whole thing again, all right, just so everybody is with us on this one, okay, on the wacky Looney Tune shenanigans that are going on here. Oh, by the way, um, many people have brought up, actually, because whenever I'm talking about Luffy's Gear 5th, I'm always referencing, like, Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck. There, there are a lot of people that reference, like, hey, this is kind of more like Tom and Jerry type shenanigans that you're, that you're, we're seeing right here, okay? And, uh, that is true, that is true, but, um, oh, man, I don't know if this is a hot take or not, uh, I don't really care for Tom and Jerry. I, I know, I know, beloved cartoon duo, I, I know, I'm horrible, but like, growing up, I never cared for Tom and Jerry. I think it's because it's not just the slapstick, because Bugs Bunny was mostly slapstick too, and I was, I loved Bugs Bunny growing up, but I think it was because they just didn't talk. Very, very rarely. I think there were a few um, episodes, a few cartoons where Tom and Jerry did speak, but it was very like limited to like one or two lines, and it was just for comedic effect or something. Um, but I always found that kind of boring growing up. I don't know, maybe I just didn't grow up in the time when Tom and Jerry was super popular, but I would always watch them and just think like, they're not talking, this isn't interesting. It's just them smacking each other back and forth or whatever, or mostly Tom trying to hit Jerry. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I watched I watched it growing up, sure, but, like, not that much. I, I'm a lot more fonder memories of, of, like, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck would probably be my favorite. Uh, you know, like, Porky Pig, Foghorn Leghorn, Yosemite Sam! You know, remember him? That, that's, that's the thing I immediately jumped to. But anyway, so Luffy pulls a tree out of the ground. So just the strength alone to do that, impressive, but we've already seen that from Luffy. Then he takes his teeth and grinds down a tree trunk to make a wooden bat. Then he pulls a paint bucket out of nowhere and then paints the bat. This is all happening within the span of like a second or less than a second, by the way. Paints the bat perfectly, has a 56 decal on it, pulls a baseball helmet out of nowhere, puts it on. There's no way a regular wooden baseball bat would be able to bounce these things back. So it's a special magical hockey baseball bat. And then he smacks all of them back. I don't know if the poison bullets blowing up was a thing that Luffy did or that was just that's what they were gonna do anyway if they hit it I kind of find it funnier if the fact Luffy coming in talk contact with them was the thing that made them blow up like tiny nukes like you would see in like a Tom and Jerry cartoon right I don't know anyway um they're sitting there, I mean, like, Dory and Broggy are, like, laughing over this, because this is absurd. Um, but they're like, hey, guys, we gotta get going. There's the fires in the forest are gonna block us off. We don't get the hell out of here. Like, okay. Um, and so Luffy is kind of, like, shouting over, and he's just like, you know, guys, we gotta get out of here, because these guys can't die. So we cut over, and we see the Goro say, all three of them begin to, like, bloom, bloom, bloom. you know, they appear in, like, their silhouetted forms here, like they originally did with Sabo. It makes me wonder, like, when they are regenerating, maybe they do assume this silhouette form. Like, it takes them a while for their forms to, like, coalesce. So maybe, like, when Sabo was encountering them and they transformed after he hit them with the Hiken, with the Fire Fist, they really did appear like amorphous black blobs just in the room. And it took them a while to regenerate fully to take the form of what we see, right? Because they go back into that silhouette kind of blobby form right now, okay? E might be the same way kind of thing. I'm not really sure. Um, so uh, Dory is, they're running away like, oh, they can't die? All right, well, let's get going then. You sure they're immortal? Like, I don't know. I've been trying to hit them all day with crap. I flipped them over. I was hitting them. I smacked them with a bunch of bombs. You just saw it. They apparently keep coming back, so I don't know what to do at this point, right? And so, Broggy just says, I've never heard of any race or ability granting that kind of power. 
which clearly indicates it's something beyond Devil Fruits. Like, even if you want to say they have these mythical zones, and I mean, there has to be something else going on here with Eam granting power, or power coming from something else. This is some, some ancient textbook on the Lost Fourth type of hockey. Like, I don't know, but it's definitely something beyond regular Devil Fruit powers. Because um, Dory and Broggy also, they're from Elbaf. I'm sure they know a little bit about Elbafian lore, and they've probably heard mythologies about, like, you know, the sun god, and but other deities as well. And, and it's like, yeah, none of this, none of this makes any sense to us. You, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I'm, I'm sure the Elbaf uh, giants and, and the people living there have heard of, like, the Lunarians and stuff, and the lost races that have been annihilated at this point, or almost annihilated. And, um, Oh my god, I just realized something. If Zoro managed to kill King, he didn't. He didn't. But if Zoro did actually kill King in that fight, then he would have exterminated an entire... Like, the Lunarians are gone after that. Now, King's still alive. King's still alive, but... Wow, yeah, Zoro came that close. I'm <laughs> just like, wow. All right, anyway. But yeah, they're, they're running away. It's like, all right, well, whatever. I guess we're just going to run away and count this as a victory. Go, ba, 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 ba. So, all right, they're having fun. That's great. Okay. So we see... Uh, we see Nami's side of things. She's talking to Jean Bay. Uh, he's like, hey, hurry up. We got to get out of here. We see the Sunny in the background and we see Usopp and everybody. It, it looks like Usopp is about to fire a slingshot. Like he's holding something up to Brook and uh, Chopper and Lilith. I'm not really sure what that is indicating there. Um, Jean Bay and Zolo are running. Zolo, sorry. Jean Bay and Zoro, or his name's Zolo. He's like a samurai, you know, guys. Uh, running through the woods. And then we have Bonnie's group finally reaching the shore with the giant Elbaf ship. However, it's not going to be that easy because we have three vice admirals standing guard right in front of the Elbaf ship, all right? We have Red King, the guy with multiple chins. We have Guillotine, the guy with like the chakram in the head and the long beard. And we have Palmski, who is the guy that can turn into an otter. So they're screwed, because he could turn into an otter and smack them around with his lucky rock, all right? You know, and uh, so those are the people there that are in the Navy. Uh, what about Davy? Is Davy still in the Navy? I don't know. Anyway, uh, Sanji is running up right behind Bonnie's group. So I'm thinking, like, if, if Bonnie and Frankie's group and there's some of, some of the giants and, like, Atlas are with them, I mean, there's three vice admirals. They're really strong. But I think they might be able to handle it. Like, Frankie's there. And then Sanji's running right past them. But also, Ethan, remember, Ethan is kind of circling the island. And we have not had an update with him in this chapter. So Ethan could very well <laughs> uh, show up as well. And Sanji might have to deal with him. So, you know, keep that in mind. We have the last scene of the chapter, last page, and a lot of stuff happens in this last page. We go to three different locations in the last page alone. First place, we have the Labo phase. We have the destroyed fourth floor of the lab where, like, the roof was completely blown off of it earlier. So we have Marcus Mars as the Itsumade yokai landing and looking down and seeing York. And York is there still chained up to, like, the, the radiator or whatever. Just like, oh my god, what are you? And just like, where's the room that's displaying the message, York? Ah, it's a monster! Who are you? Just leave me alone! And then we just cut, we cut away. So York clearly has never seen this thing before. We do not see Kaku, and I actually could see the command room. We don't see Kaku bubbled in the corner or anything like that. Dude, if I was Kaku, I know he's severely wounded, but I would get up and like try to like wheel away with like the hamster ball. Like, 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 like I don't need to be involved in this. I'm out of here. I'm just a guy. I'm just your humble giraffe. Don't mind me. I'm out of here. Um, so, after York calms down, uh, she might know where it is. She might not. See, that's the thing. Like, when Vegapunk relayed that message, he recorded the message. Wouldn't that have been logged in punk records? In the message, we saw uh, Shaka there. We saw Pythagoras. Um, maybe York was asleep when Vegapunk recorded the message, but maybe it was still logged, or maybe it wasn't logged in punk records. Um, th that was a question that was brought up. Like, shouldn't York have already known about this kill switch message um, and therefore relayed it to the Garosei? So I guess it's possible that Vegapunk, the Stella, never logged it, but that already kind of implies that he knew that there was a traitor. Like, ooh, uh, gee shucks, Quasar, I better make sure to not relay this message in punk records because one of me might turn out to be a, a traitor or something. Like, what's the reason of not logging that experience? Uh, but I guess we're going to find out. I guess we'll see. Next place we see is the marine battleship where Kizaru got sent flying in the last chapter, and he's there, and he's just like, oh, oh, Kizaru-san, what happened to you? All right, let us treat you. Oh, my wounds run deep. Just, just let me be. Okay. So I think right now, Kizaru is out of the fight. 
Does this mean that Kizaru can't fight anymore, like physically, like he doesn't have any gas left in the tank? No, I think this is a situation of Kizaru getting smacked. I mean, he definitely got smacked around by Luffy. Like, he's he hurts right now. I'm not saying that, like, his attacks didn't get, like, Luffy's attacks didn't hurt him. They, they clearly fucking did. I'm just saying that, like, okay, do you ever have a moment in your life where uh, you're like, man, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and then, you know, somebody just, you know, punches you in the face in the form of a giant sun god, and you get sent flying into a battleship? Okay, I couldn't think of a parallel, all right. But it's like, Kizaru has an opportunity to be like, okay, I, I got knocked out, I lost the fight, no, 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 the fight's over, fight's over, I don't want to fight anymore, I'm done, just leave me here. I'm done. And just like, sh sure, Kizaru, we can heal you. I mean, you might be able to move. No, no, I'm defeated. I'm soundly defeated. Just leave me here. I, I think Kizaru is just like, yeah, I don't want to fight anymore today. <laughs> I don't want to. I had to murder a friend of mine. Um, we'll just, this is an excuse. Like, oh, yeah, we'll just say Luffy punched me really hard and I was unconscious. And just, just, just go along with it. I'm, I'm not getting up. All right, and so that's Kizaru. And then we have the last scene of the chapter, and the last scene for the next month or so. Uh, hey, everybody, something really big just showed up on the island. Even bigger than a giant, much bigger than a giant. Well, what kind of giant are we talking about here? Because we got oars, and we got oars junior. We don't have time for this size scaling bullshit. A giant robot is walking through the island. Is that good enough for you, Frank? <laughs> Just, okay, so we cut over and we see the Iron Giant has finally gotten up. Took long enough for that thing to move. And it's creaking and it's moving through the island and it's bathed in flames and it's just moving. It's like a titan in the middle of an inferno and it seems to be saying something and we just cut over to the giant. The last panel, we just see the giant bathed in flames. And uh, actually, now that I think about it, is uh, is the robot causing the fire, or is that something from the Goro says antics? When did a oh no oh the Buster call right? I'm an idiot. Like, huh? I wonder where these flames are coming from. Uh, it might have something to do with uh, about a hundred navy battleships bombarding the island with incendiary rounds. Yeah, that, that might have something to do with it. Yeah. So yeah, I was like, where did the fire come from? All right, we're in the middle of a Buster call. Sorry, a lot of stuff happening right now. But yeah, Giant gets up and he's just walking through the flames, and then he just says. Forgive me, Joy Boy. I wonder how the Iron Giant sounds. I wonder if it sounds like the Iron Giant from those, like, is like, you stay, I go, no following. Sorry, Joy Boy. Or I wonder if it's more mechanical, like, forgive me, Joy Boy, but maybe more deep because it's like a giant. It's just like, forgive me. Joy Boy. Yeah, that's the one right there. That's the one. We'll do that one. I am the Iron Giant must protect sun god initiating combat protocol updates not necessary <laughs> yeah 200 years worth of updates it's gonna be a while he's running on like windows 95 right here okay um well that's the end of the chapter uh geez i don't even know uh, okay i mean i mean oda certainly set us up for a lot okay he certainly set us for a lot here and oh by the way uh, it says three week break i've been saying four week because I think the way it's gonna work, because it's like three weeks for like the official release, so maybe add an extra week onto that. I'm just planning there to be no One Piece for like a month. That's that's me personally. But um, it's something like that, I don't know. Um, so I think York is gonna calm down and maybe she doesn't have the recollection of the call, but she might know where the message is being transmitted from, like where a room like that could exist on Egghead. She might know that information. Uh, Kizer is done fighting. He's not getting back up after this. Um, now, the Gorosei do have to take time to regenerate. So that does give Dory, Bragi, and Luffy. I'm glad they're all on the same page there. Like, they're not sticking around to keep fighting the Gorosei. Even L Luffy's the one that picked up on that. Luffy's like, we have to hurry. These guys can regenerate. So he's like, we gotta get out of here now. You know, like, we can keep... Like, Luffy's aware that his, his form takes time. I mean, it's gonna run out at some point, right? I mean, he was able to get the second win with the food supply, but that's not gonna last forever. He's gotta keep moving. And so Dory and Bragi are like, yeah, this was... We're here to help you escape. We're not here to, like, wipe out everybody on the island. We're here to go. So, yeah, I, they're gonna get there. I mean, but, like, Ethan is still running around the island, and uh, Marcus is upstairs, and so... But he's dealing with everything at the lab right now. His his concern is not with Zoro or Jinbei or with Luchi or with Nami or the Sunny 
or anything like that. His deal is eliminating the message, getting rid of that thing, right? Um, and so I, I don't know where this is going to go. Maybe the message isn't even coming from the Labo phase. That's an interesting theory. Like it's from some other location, like outside of Egghead it's being transmitted to. That would actually be really cool if it wasn't even on the island. So there's no way you're stopping it in six minutes. Um, we're, we're moving along at a nice pace. I say as we're about to enter like a massive break, but yeah, we're, we're four minutes in the last few chapters. That's pretty good by manga standards. Dragon Ball Z, we would have still been like less than 10 seconds into Goku fighting Frieza. Um, but yeah, really solid chapter. Oda really busted out all the stops there. We had one last really good, um, I think this is the best antics with Luffy's Gear 5th so far. I mean, we've had some really fun things. Dude, I remember when he was fighting Luchi and everybody lost their shit when Luffy pulled the goggles out of nowhere. Like, Luffy could just make goggles from his hair? That's crazy. It's like, yeah, he can also make paints and uh, a baseball hat and just like baseball helmet and everything like that. So yeah, there's really no limit here what Luffy can do. I mean, like, I'm sure you couldn't cheat the system by like, Luffy's like, I want a magic hockey nullifying sword. And he just pulls that out of his hair. I don't think it's something like that. But within reason, he could probably make any object he wants and then give that object the properties to fight. Like, he's pulling out this giant, like, it's just a piece of wood that he grinded down to make into a baseball bat. And I guess he added hockey to it, as well as a nice coating of lacquer. But, like, at the end of the day, that thing was able to knock back a Garosei attack. So it's like, whatever he grabs, it's like that lightning bolt when he fought Kaido. It, like, it confor conforms to his wackiness, his, his tune force, as it were, right? And the, uh, the, the shenanigans with him getting the scars blasted off his body, it was funny. Dude, we're, I mean, like, okay, you know how in One Piece we have the Dawn sound effect? If you've ever played the One Piece card game, Dawn, you know, the Dawn cards. I think we are very close to Luffy doing something that results in the Dawn onomatopoeia appearing over him, and then he just picks up the onomatopoeia and beats the shit out of a member of the Gorosei with the onomatopoeia sound effect. That, that kind of stuff has happened in other manga before, like they've done that kind of shit before. We're very close to that happening. Like, like Luffy just grabbing a, a character, like a hiragana over his head and just throwing those at the enemy. Like, that's gonna happen at some point probably, right? It's just, there's no limit here. So, great chapter, fantastic. Did we get a lot of Zoro in chapter 1111? No, we did not, but um, maybe we'll get some in 1112. I guess we'll have to wait and see. But anyway, this was a fabulous chapter. I don't think we're going to get chapter 11,111. So, you know, and I also don't even think we're going to get chapter 2,222. So this is probably the last time that we're going to have all numbers lined up sequentially. It's kind of sad when you really think about it that way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just the way the news goes. I wonder what Morgan's is up to right now. We need to like have a special Morgan's report on how do you even put all of this shit in the paper? Like, okay, let me put it this way. If you were big news Morgan's, I'll leave you with this question, this, this hypothetical. Put yourself in the shoes of big news Morgan's. What do you put on the front page of the damn paper? What string of words and photo do you put on the front page. You don't have infinite space on the front page. You can't put like 30 words as a headline. Like we're talking a headline. We're talking like 10 or less words. Preferably only like maybe three or four at most. So let me know. Let me know what you put on the paper of the World Economic Journal after the events of Egghead. <laughs> Thanks for watching everybody. This will be teching. I'm gonna go practice for that baseball team now. Da 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 da! Charge! End screen! <laughs>